Welcome to the studio, Eric Banner and Robert Connolly. Hi, Carl. Carl. Um, you guys are on the trail promoting the new film, Force of Nature, which is also known as The Dry 2. Is it really called The Dry 2, or is that just like to help the world understand what it is? Yeah, we talked a lot about that. It's a subtitle after the, the title of the film, and you know, lots of discussions about how you let an audience know that you've made a follow-up film, so it seemed kind of a pretty straightforward way to let people know. Mm. Uh, in terms of what it looks like and how it feels, it, it is really not the dry at all. It's the wet, it's the cold, it's the bloody freezing. Um, how was it making making this film, and where did, where did you make it, first of all? When did you make it, and what was the experience like? It was pretty amazing. I mean, we filmed in the bush... Very close to here, really. You know, the Otways. Here being Melbourne. Here being Melbourne, yeah. Down down in the Otways and up in the Dandenong and Yarra Ranges and Latrobe Valley and, like, all these satellite um, towns mm. and um, incredible rainforests, subtropical rainforests uh, outside of Melbourne. It's interesting because I think people don't realise that the Victorian bush looks like that. Mm. You know, m most people outside of Victoria think of it as, you know, in the way it's depicted in cinema, as scrubby, mm. you know, um, dry landscape, but it was spectacular. It was wet and cold by the look of it. It, it was, but it was also, like, breathtakingly beautiful. Mm. Absolutely beautiful. If you, were, if you were wearing the right kind of clothes, it was just spectacular. Well, you, of course, play the detective Aaron Fork again, uh, which is really the point of con continuity between the dry and yeah. this film, right? I mean, it, is, is there anything else that carries over? I'm trying to Not recall. Not much. There's a little bit of subtext in terms of his, in terms of his background, but mm. essentially, yeah, it does very much feel standalone. In fact, someone mentioned something interesting to Rob the other day that it's pretty unique that you could actually watch them in reverse order, mm. which is, I think, unusual for follow-ups or, or sequels but you could definitely do that in this case mm -hmm. yeah watch the dry like watch force of nature and then watch the dry like a prequel find out more about <laughs> the character <laughs> um so you spend a lot of time outdoors in this film I, and i uh if i remember correctly you're mostly wearing jeans and and, uh, and a jacket i mean <laughs> it was wet right i mean it was it looks like it's actually wet. Yeah, no, it was it was brutal for the cast and the crew, especially. There's no doubt about that. There, it was it was probably the toughest shoot I've ever seen a crew have to endure. Yeah, because mainly because there was no respite. Once you clocked on for the day, you hiked 30, 45 minutes into a location, and you were there until the sun went down. Yeah, and there were no tents. There was no cover. There was no furnace. There was no fire. There was no bar heater. There were, you know, a porta potty and and you know sandwiches on your lap and that that the glamour just, of uh, filmmaking, right? Hundred <laughs> um, percent. But the beauty of that is, you know, obviously there are no set visits. There's no members of the public. You're you're completely on your own. You're isolated, and it brings about a a, a kind of energy and camaraderie that you just don't get filming in a studio or something like that. So. There is something special about it. Are you an outdoorsman, generally? Absolutely. Yeah, I hate shooting in studios. Do you? I hate it. I feel like I'm in a casino. <laughs> yeah. Because they're also usually attached to larger budgets where once you once you start at the beginning of the day, you're not really sure when the day is going to end. And I think from an actor's perspective, and I'm sure for a director, it's just harder to pace yourself. Mm. And shooting on location, shooting natural light day for day, there is a real energy that comes from the camera comes out of the box and you know exactly roughly what time the camera's going back in. I don't mean to sound like a bludger, but I, I mean it in terms of there's a focused energy, that a creative energy that yeah. comes from that. Yeah, you know, you can sort of judge when to spend it, right? I guess exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about as a director? I mean, when you're, you're working in the elements there's a lot that you can't control. I mean, that, that's that's the big difference between a studio shoot and a location shoot, isn't it? That you can control the environment in a studio. You can't when you're on location. That's right. It's kind of part of the magic of, you know, every day setting off into this incredible landscape and taking the actors right into the heart of it. I mean, part of this film is a survival story and it can't feel like it filmed just down the road at the Botanic Gardens. You want to actually see the actors mm. in the real world. And I love that the cast were happy to jump into that and to go on that adventure, exactly as you say, like the days would offer up surprises. I mean, it did rain about 75% of our shoot. We picked a very good time of year to film. It's one of the challenges. It was winter? It was yeah. the heart of winter. Yeah, right. And these valleys are wet. They're full of leeches. They're muddy. Um, there are locations we filmed in that no one's ever filmed in before. Right. And 
places that are off the beaten track with no paths. And so the crew really had to kind of embrace the idea of that. But for me as a director, I love it. I'm like Eric. I've never actually in 25 years of being a director filmed in a studio. Never? Never. So people always talk about, oh, studios are the, you know, and I go, well, actually my films tend to kind of lean into the more location-based storytelling. Mm -hmm. You think of The Dry was out in the Mallee and the Wimmera, Blueback was over in the Ningaloo Reef and Bremer Bay, and now here we are in this kind of incredible bush. And I I think the the idea that a char- the landscape is a character in Australian cinema for me goes back to... Mm-hmm. Peter Weir's films that I fell in love with when I was a kid Mm. and he took us into those amazing films from Picnic at Hanging Rock on so that's always my my preference yeah yeah um leeches did either of you cop any leeches? Oh, yeah, let's I, got pretty, I got pretty lucky. Rob, not so lucky. Yeah, no, it was pretty tough. I mean, when, when, you, when you're <laughs> extracting leeches from people's eyeballs... You oh, know, no, <laughs> really? When one of the crew got 17 in one day oh. and the cast... No, it was... I mean, I grew up in the bush outside the Blue Mountains. I yeah. feel very familiar with that. And they're not real. It's like getting a mosquito bite. Yeah, yeah. But we, there was a valley that we nicknamed Leech gully because no one had ever filmed there we decided to build the yeah that's exactly right we decided to build the hut there right and take a crew of 75 people as eric's always said the leeches were having a field day let's look at this from the leeches perspective this was the greatest (laughs) shoot of all time they looked at the call sheet yeah they looked at the call sheet and went they're coming here no one's ever come here We should just, for, for people who, who aren't familiar with it, we should just very briefly give a, like a, you know, two line synopsis of, of the story. It is based on uh, Jane Harper's work again. Yes. So yeah. t- t- tell us, the, you know, what's the pitch on this? Well, it's pretty good. Like, it's Jane's follow up to The Dry. But mm. actually, we talk about this idea when we were deciding whether to do the sequel. It's actually a, a, quite a, a straightforward and good, bold idea that we love. Uh, five women go on a corporate retreat into the bush and only four return. And the woman that is missing is an informer for Aaron Fork in a case that he's investigating of corporate crime. Mm. So it's a very straightforward kind of idea. I mean, we loved it. Like when Eric and I, you know, we finished the dry, went off and did Blueback. I came back, sat down with Eric. It's like, should we do this sequel? And we were talking about the various things we loved. And we just kept coming back to this. Who are going to play these five women? Have we ever seen that before in Australian cinema, a story Mm. like that? An ensemble out there in the bush. And I think it's very unique and distinctive in Jane's writing that she was able to take those characters and as she did with the dry, put them in an amazing landscape. Mm. In many ways, it it was a much easier premise and sell than the dry. Like to try and describe what the dry is and about is actually far more difficult than, than Force of Nature. Mm-hmm. I've got, got to ask, I mean, uh, The Dry was an, an extraordinary success in terms of its Australian box office. It was at 21 million or something, yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, and that came out at a time when there was a dearth of f- big releases in the cinema. So you were, you know, COVID was playing havoc. You benefited from that, arguably. Maybe you didn't. Maybe it would have done that anyway. I mean, it's hard to know, isn't it, given those circumstances. Does that put a certain pressure on you with this one in terms of like what your expectation is and what the distributor's expe- uh, expectation is in terms of how it might perform, given the environment's very different now? Yeah, yeah. Look, I think when uh, The Dry came out, it was we were easing out of the pandemic and everyone thought cinema would not recover. Yeah. Cinemas had been shut. Everyone said it's over. And there were lots written about it. You know, is this the end? Is it the future of streaming? And it it just hasn't been the case. Mm. And so I'm excited that Force of Nature is part of a a moment in time where people are going back to the movies. I've spoken to some people in exhibition, really interesting summer. So last summer it was Avatar, 51% of the box office. But this year there's been about 12 films that have worked And people are going back to the movies. They're getting into the habit of it. Instead of seeing one big blockbuster, they're going maybe two or three times. And so for me, you know, my own passionate love of cinema, I mean, I'm excited that Force of Nature's out there and we're being so well released by our friends at Roadshow Films. But for me, to be part of this new era where cinema is important and we're we're seeing in America, Mm. the big streamers are, are pivoting now back to giving theatrical lives to film before they play on the platform. So that's really got to be an indication that people are going to the movies again. 
Do you think that's where it's going to go? That the the streamers will actually embrace the theatrical uh, release, for, not not for ever, everything, obviously, but for you know certain types of titles that they'll see that as that's the platform. That's what lets people know that the film is out there, that it exists. It'll get a proper run, not the not the two week window that it's that you know Netflix has traditionally given to its Oscar contenders and nothing else. Um, and then then it'll go to streaming. Do you think that's where where it's moving? Abs- absolutely. I mean. Would you want to be the streaming platform that had Barbie or Oppenheimer, you know, <laughs> 60 days after they were in cinemas? Yes. Yeah. And it's been a really exciting shift because early on there was a view that, oh, no, that takes our audience away yeah. and it needs to... But then there's so much content now. If you just open on a streaming platform, you're very flat-footed. Yeah. But you're not flat-footed if you've been in cinemas for a month before. So pretty exciting as a filmmaker Mm. I feel like it's a very optimistic time people are going to the cinemas the streaming platforms are aware of that value and here we are you know with a big Australian film following on from the dry so the timing is excellent Mm. let's talk a little bit about you guys working together tell us for the readers who don't know or the listeners who don't know about this talk us through your uh, your working relationship and when it started and what how you actually you know come to do things together yeah well we first Started working together on Romulus, my father, which was, I forget how many years ago now, but... 2007. Yeah. Or so, yeah, so quite a while ago, and Rob was producing, and Richard Roxburgh was directing, um, and Rob and I just got to know each other through the course of that film. He was based in Sydney at the time, and then soon after that was was uh, looking at moving to Melbourne. I already had a, had a tiny office in Melbourne. Making films, acting in films is really lonely. You spend, you know, 10 months of the year on your own, twiddling your thumbs, reading scripts. And uh, so I said, Rob, do you want to look at getting an office together? And he was really open to the idea. And so we rented an office for, for many, many years now. And we, we finally bought a little place that we renovated and that we're in. But we, we just got together. We, we have no formal structure. We have no pressure to make films together or to do anything together. Um, and that's really worked well for us mm. because we we don't have that pressure of a company. Rob does his thing, I do my thing. When it suits us, we get together and work on on, on stuff collaboratively. But it's it's really great, and we've been able to just be each other's ear and counsel each other about the business and life, and 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 just yeah, have each other's back. And it's 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 a lonely road, and it's 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 the one thing I've been encouraging whenever I meet young actors or young filmmakers to really really try and latch on to to people early early on and and try and work together and try and encourage each other because it's a it's a lonely road Mm. Mm. it's amazing when you think practically of us not having a commitment to work together so when we you share an actual physical space yeah Yeah. Yeah. and we weren't sure separate production companies that's That's right right. that come together on these films if or if they uh, you know benefit from it but um bruna papandrea uh, sends me the dry to read and so I read it that night and I'm in the office and I ring Bruna back and say I love it I'd love to do it and she says great let's do it you know and I hang up and I walk across the office we sit down have a cup of coffee and Eric says what are you doing next oh Bruna's just offered me the dry he goes I just read it it's great I said do you want to play the role he said oh, it's, be, it's like that, speed dating <laughs> then I ring Bruna back uh, Bruna I've got it like for Bruna it's like so I've got a director and actor and in about <laughs> five <hour>. minutes <laughs> it doesn't happen that way very often it's the easiest you're making in history <laughs> that's right that's right yeah. um <laughs> do you ever have to like feel jealous about what the other's working on no 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 I love it I love that you know in the office there's kind of posters you know steven spielberg ridley scott robert connolly is perfect <laughs> <laughs> part of the holy trinity <laughs> no no i think in fact it's probably the opposite it's probably the op- it's like ex- the excitement for each other when we do our respective work yeah. and then it, it kind of leads to really interesting things like uh, even my film paper planes when you know i was struggling to finance that to an eric and he came on board as one of the producing team and you know, it kind of has a bit of um, a kind of helping each other on, yeah. our, on, on our way without needing to be proprietorial or have ownership of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eric, you've, you've made a pretty good fist of having a career, uh, you know, a pretty high-profile career while based in Melbourne. I mean, has it, it must have presented challenges at times. Um, I don't think... I think I've chosen the easy route, to be honest. Um, in what way? Well, if you have an international career, if you're lucky enough, you, you're traveling for work. And yeah. so it's never the same place more than once. It's usually Europe or the UK. Mm. 
And so where do you base yourself? You're always going to be away from home. So um, it's like whack-a-mile. Like it doesn't matter where you choose to live, you're, you're, it's, it, it's not going to be the place that you're going to be working from next. So I came to the conclusion I'm much better off just staying at home. And then in the downtime, I'm, I'm at home yeah. as opposed to my wife's originally from Sydney. We could have chosen London. And then in those six or eight months when you're not working, neither of you are at home yeah. and you're in a city and then the, the next job's in Bulgaria, you know. So staying here has just been the easiest route, to be honest. Yeah, right. So no, no sort of drawbacks? It hasn't sort of been an impediment to landing work or being in the room with directors or casting agents? The only time sort of I, f- I feel, and I get a sense of this when I, when I spend time with Rob, I have a few really close friends of mine who are writers in, in America. And whenever I'm there and I spend time with them and we we talk ideas and I, 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 I yearn for that I really do I, I come away after a week and I go oh man I wish I could hang around longer I'm sure we would have come up with some ideas or so there's probably things that we haven't created as a result of that but that that's really being nitpicky and, and selfish I think there probably would be some things that would have emanated from spending more time with, with, with other people but then I wouldn't have made these films with Rob so yeah. it's it's six of one half a dozen of the other I don't think it's, it's it definitely hasn't affected my acting portfolio in, in, in that respect in, in some ways I think in the early days it probably helped having some distance and not, not being around and not being available yeah, right. creates a sense of FOMO for Americans that they can't really get their head around <laughs> <laughs> when I was at the um, the, the premiere at the uh, the Rivoli the other week, um, and I I, I, th- I think you you <laughs> you told the people uh, in the audience if you if you enjoy this film, tell everybody because the dry was such a word of mouth success. But if you don't, have a good long hard look at yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right in thinking that was a bit of a throwback to Pointer? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just a yeah, it was just a throwaway. I just thought it was a good way to wrap up the speech. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you ever yearn for the, those days of of you know stand up comedy? I, I do. Yeah, I'd be lying if I said I don't. Because uh, my, my, my brain hasn't changed. My brain still thinks in sketch. Yeah, absolutely, and still thinks in stand up. And I write stand up when I'm driving. I just don't write it down. <laughs> so, and then when I, I, you know, close friends like Kitty Flanagan, who I watch her work, and she's amazing. And then I, I see Netflix specials, and and your your mind sort of races. And I love the creative immediacy of stand up. It's so pure. Um, so yeah, I do, I do, I do miss. I do miss it. Could you imagine ever doing it again? Um, there's a small part of me that could, and then there's a then there's another side of me that can't. So I have, I have a bit of a battle in my head over it. I think I think m- my kids would probably barricade the house so heavily <laughs> that if they got wind that I was going to go out and do stand up again, that I wouldn't be able to. I'd have to go up the chimney, I think, to get to a gig. <laughs> I'd be mortified, would they? But who cares? Who cares? The, you know, that young generation is so paranoid about who everyone thinks about them. And, well, that's true, yeah. isn't it? They are. What about you, Rob? Do you have a yearning to do stand-up? It's interesting talking about comedy, though, uh, and, and directing comedy. Yeah. I've kind of dabbled a bit in it with um, Paper Planes, I guess, is probably the mm. one that has a very strong underpinning of comedy. And I think it terrifies me. You know, I've worked in various different genres over my career. Yeah. I think the skill of it is incredible. And people who can pull it off are exceptional and the, there's probably a skill set I don't have Th- that's not to say that I wouldn't be excited to explore it um, and actually to find out what it's like on set you know because I understand sometimes it's a bit looser on set there's a little bit more of a sense of kind of exploring and and you've got people in front of the camera who actually are funny mm. and able to kind of um, contrive sequences in in the moment is that the case? Is it a little bit looser? Yeah, it can be. It can be a lot of fun. It can be a lot of fun. I, and I'm always surprised that we don't make more of them because we have this reputation for being really laid back and, and having a great sense of humour. But we gravitate towards some heavy drama Yeah. as, as cinema goers, Australians, and Australian filmmakers. Yeah, it's true. Why is um, that? I don't know. You know more about this than you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, that's a really good question. Well, maybe... Well, we're definitely not um, as prolific in terms of writing comedy and we don't have that that pool of talent that's continually turning over yeah. scripts and drafts and, and, and being improved upon and workshops. So I don't think we can expect to turn out a lot of great comedies. So obviously when someone comes up with a great original idea and, and it works, it makes complete sense and it, it works because it's come from a singular idea and it's a, it's a good idea. Mm. 
but I don't I don't feel like we have that kind of team of people that are right now fevering away on a on a comedy script yeah. like you would in America. Just you while driving. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to ask you seriously: if if one of the streamers came to you and said, "Hey, Eric, we will listen to that podcast and you talked <laughs> about stand up. <laughs> We'd love you to do a, a one hour special. Would you do it? Uh no, not a hope." No, and that would be that would be reverse engineering. I think if you were gonna if you were gonna step your toe in the water of stand up, you just have to start from the beginning again and yeah. like not think about the outcome and just what what would it be like to go and do ten minutes somewhere and just yeah. So no, you couldn't. That'd sounds like a hard ask. That's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> <laughs> An empty pub on a Tuesday night. <laughs> I reckon you might get a few people turn up though. Um, what about Aaron Fork? Is he is he done as a as a character? or Is there more to come? Do you think? It's an interesting question. I mean, we didn't really imagine making a sequel when we were shooting The Dry. Mm. It, it felt like the miracle of even getting The Dry up and it being successful and led to this film. And we feel really very grateful for Australian audiences really getting behind The Dry um, and championing. Without that, there was never going to be a force of nature. So I guess in lots of ways, it's just watch this space. Let's see how we go with the release of this film and whether people want more. I just recall Carl came to visit us out on set for the dry. I did. Yeah. I did. And it was really dry. <laughs> it was. It was Before so the drought broke. Yeah, yeah, it really was, wasn't How it? How didn't we get you into that valley with the leeches? What happened on <laughs> There this? was talk about it, but, but then there was the, uh, uh, there's a lot of leeches. <laughs> and it's a really long hike. And I was like, that sounds awesome. I'd love to do that. But maybe not the leeches so much, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and is there more on the plate for you at the moment, Rob? Have you got a, another project on the go? You seem to always have more projects on the go. You are as a as a writer, director, producer, and and I think sometimes distributor as well, right? I mean, you're a you're pretty prolific. Yeah, we've got some exciting projects this year. Um, we've got Adam Elliott's Stop Mo Animation Memoir of a Snail, right? And which is in post production, produced okay. by Liz Carney, who produced um, Paper Planes and Blue back with me and is a friend and that's exciting and I've been over in WA the company produced a film with an Irish a director Lorcan Finnegan with Nicolas Cage and that film is in post-production um, and no, it's always interesting we've got another family film with um, uh, we during COVID commissioned 10 animators to do an animation in response to Alison Lester's book Magic Beach uh -huh. which we're putting together so it's kind of eclectic I mean I I always love the you know the cinema side of what we do it's always tempting you know to go on a, and I've had fun directing te television from the slap on to Barracuda mm. and other things but I think cinema has always kind of been this magnet that's drawn me back and the challenge right now I guess of course is because people have so much great stuff they can watch at home is how to make things cinematic yeah and that's why force of nature it's like the dry on big large format cameras big music big landscapes big acting you know actors and a great ensemble so it's, it's always about trying to raise the bar a bit yeah one thing i, I think it's worth mentioning is uh your sort of tendency to find young talent new talent um how how, how does that sort of play out for you how does it come to be because you always seem to have some pretty uh impressive new faces in your work oh thank you yeah look i think um you know definitely with directors you know i, th I know we're all really proud of what job clerk did with her film sweet as um but with the casting of the films i mean you know my secret weapon in my career is my wife jane norris who's mm. cast all my work for 25 years and she is just always on my back about who is the new talent who are we going to put in this film that no one's seen before? Think of those young actors in the dry that have all gone on now, they're having massive careers. And with Force of Nature, you know, C.C. Stringer and Lucy Ansell in those two critical roles. Um, but, you know, she, she you know, speaks back to the day of, you know, Muriel's wedding and how excited we all were to see Tony Collette and Rachel Griffiths yeah. in their first film and how our national cinema has always been an incredible engine room of new talent. Mm. So, you know, watch this space in future film and television that, w that we're involved with. I think it's a great fundamental principle. She, she also is really big on finding actors that people love that haven't been seen for a while. Right. And Deborah Lee Furness is awesome, fun to She's work with. She's fantastic in this film, yeah. I mean, yeah. Anatov is always great. Jacqueline McKenzie, I mean, you know, it's a great female cast as well. I mean, it's, it's your film, Eric, but, you know, there's a lot oh, of women it's, in it's, it. It's, it's, it's a five <laughs> women's film, there's no doubt. Yeah. I mean, they're just incredible and we were gifted the fact that Jane Harper has this unique ability 
to write such distinct characters. Mm. And there wasn't once when I read that book where I was like, hey, which one's Jill, which one's Beth, which one's Bree, which one's Alice? Like, it just all makes sense. And, and casting those roles was so exciting because we knew that, that we would end up with five very, very different characters in the bush. Mm. And the audience is sitting there thinking, which one am I? <laughs> how would i survive this yeah. yeah it's a bit it's a bit like alone isn't it <laughs> yeah. yeah one of those shows what's next for you you got anything on the on the um, go yeah so the um after we finished force of nature i headed off to berlin and uh, shot a film called berlin nobody which was another adaptation based on a book by nicholas hogg called tokyo um we changed the setting and, and tweaked it a bit and and set it in berlin and so another great little drama thriller with uh, Jordan Scott the daughter of Ridley Scott who uh, adapted the the screenplay and directed that so um, right. uh, yeah that'll I'm not sure when that's coming out but it's probably sometime sometime this year and there's a couple other things that I'm working on that I can't announce just yet yeah I've okay. been working on for a while alright well thank you again Eric Banner and Robert Connolly it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you good luck with the release of Force of Nature I'm sure it'll find an audience and do brilliantly and look forward to seeing what you both do next Thank you Thanks, so much. Well, Thank great you. to talk to you.